Well, welcome and great to see everyone. And if you want to put your cameras on, uh, you're on, keep yourself, if you wouldn't mind, on mute just so that uh, we can kind of have our dialogue uh, semi uninterrupted. Um, and uh, 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 hopefully you all can see the, uh, you've got the, the, the slides there. Everybody see those? Good. Yes. Um, well, oh, whoops. Yeah. So what we, um, what we decided to do this year, uh, different than past Sun conferences for, I see a lot of familiar faces, people who've been to these in the past, is to um, do breakouts. And this is the, the kind of leadership at systems breakout session. Um, as such, uh, last I saw, we're, we're, we don't have so many people in this that we can't kind of dialogue. Um, we are, uh, uh, I was really pleased with the folks who agreed to uh, kind of join as the, uh, as the panelists today. We've got uh, Kevin Coggin, raise your shit. Give a, give a wave, Kevin. Kevin is the executive director at Coast Transit Authority in Gulfport, Mississippi. Uh, he's been in public transit since 1989 and has been directing CTA since 2003, in September of 2003. Uh, Kevin was there when we founded the Sun Group and has been somebody that uh, I consider, like many of you, as much as a friend and a, coll a colleague as as a member, so welcome, Kevin. Uh, Heather Damelin is from uh, uh, Mountain Line in Flagstaff, Arizona. Give us a wave, Heather. She has she's tricked out her background, or she's outside. I, you know, let's let's. Let, I, I'm going to assume that's a, a, a tricked out background. She's been the with Mountain Line for 18 years, and Heather and I. When was it? It must have been. 10 years ago when we were working on that, um, that job links group. Uh, uh, yeah, I say that's where I met Heather uh, that long ago. Um, uh, she began, I loved it. She gave me a brief bio as a money counter. Uh, and you know, in some ways from, from being a money counter to moving up to GM, once again, you become a money counter. Uh, uh, it's a kind of a cyclical thing. Um, she was selected uh, formally in June to be the general manager at, uh, at, at Mountain Line in, in, in Flagstaff, although she was doing that on a temporary basis since February. And, you know, wow, like, Heather, we're just going to throw you into the deep water when you start running mm -hmm. transit in February, uh, and, you know, and you didn't run away and you accepted the job in June. So that's a good sign. Uh, last with us is Bob Fume. Bob is with Colts, which is the County of Lackawanna Transit System, and that is headquartered in Scranton, Pennsylvania. He's been there since 2008. He was with another system in Pennsylvania, serving in the similar capacity, Hazleton Public Transit, for eight years prior to that. In addition to the work in Scranton, Bob also was recently named chair of Pennsylvania Public Transit Association, which is one of the largest state transit associations and, and so uh, welcome to our three presenters. We're going to present this session conversationally, okay? So the slides, uh, 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 and I'm going to get to you, Paul, in a second. You're, net, you're up next. The, the, the slides will, will only be a, a placeholder. But I did want to say that this session is sponsored by TripSpark, and I see Paul is on is joining us so uh, i'm going to run his video and then hopefully we can uh, he can engage as well in the discussion paul and i as he often alludes to uh, we go back nearly 30 years i met paul when he was running a rural operation on the eastern shore of maryland so uh, uh here's here's trip sparks message and we really appreciate their sponsorship of this session Hi, I'm Paul Comfort, host of Transit Unplugged and part of the TripSpark team, where we provide fixed route, paratransit, demand response, and ride sharing software, allowing small and mid-sized agencies the same technology that the larger ones have. As you know, the public transportation industry is changing and microtransit is becoming much more popular. So today we're excited to announce our brand new microtransit app called Rides on Demand. It will allow your agency to offer really flexible service between fixed route and individualized options. 
Thank you, Paul. Appreciate that. And, and again, we'll, we'll bring that up. Uh, 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 you saw, by the way, in the background for Paul, uh, oh, there he, there he, there he is. Uh, that's his book, uh, which, you know, you have to question Paul's uh, decision making. He included a chapter that I wrote. Uh, and and I, I laugh because um, I had some staff members that told me uh, they read it and they said, wow, Scott, that that's that's really good, you know, what you wrote. And, and I, I told them, you know, uh, previous to being the, the executive director at CTA, I was a writer. So that, that, that's actually what I used to do. Uh, for wow. There's our panel and what we're going to cover today. And if you can read all those, great. But if not, we're going to start by just going right down the line and asking each of our presenters real quickly, give us a sense of the size of your operation so everyone kind of can can have that for context, number of vehicles, routes, annual ridership, that kind of thing. So why don't you start, Bob? Yeah, um, Scott, so we service the La County of Lackawanna and parts of Luzerne County and our size of our system, we have 136 employees. We have uh, 33 fixed route buses, 35 footers, 36 smaller uh, buses and vans for our shared ride program. Uh, our annual budget's $14 million, roughly. Our fixed route ridership is uh, a little bit over a million trips annually. Uh, I'm basing this on uh, pre-COVID. Uh, also, for fixed route, a little bit over 1 million annual trips. For shared ride, about 116,000 trips annually. Um, we have 26 fixed routes and 23 on Saturday. Okay. And how about you, Kevin? Yeah, we uh, our service area is the three counties on the Gulf Coast of Mississippi. We don't really have any geographic restrictions. Uh, that's where we do most of what we do. We provide fixed route, uh, demand response, and we run a, a pretty good van pool program, uh, peak demand on uh, fixed route uh, is, 17 buses, seven routes, demand response peak is 15, and we're running 38 van pools. Our annual ridership all included is about 800,000. That was in 2019. We have been as high as over a million. Uh, we, a company of about 100 employees and our annual operating budget is six and a half million dollars. Thanks, Kevin. Heather. We directly operate both our fixed route and paratransit services all located within the city of Flagstaff. We do have a small van pool program that goes outside the city into some areas of the county. And we have a taxi a subsidy program that also allows people to travel outside the city. Um, our community is about 70,000 full-time residents, but we do uh, house one of our three state universities. So we have um, some seasonal residents related to the school year. Uh, we have about 100 employees and 35 revenue vehicles over both systems. Our annual ridership was actually at 2.5 million riders per year and trending upward at about 4% per year. And then there was COVID and we actually ended the year pretty well. We ended at 2.1 million. So we didn't lose a significant amount of ridership. Um, right now we are still at about 40% of our typical ridership and about 50% of our ridership comes from the university and those students have not yet returned to our clinic. I mean, I think, thank you. Uh, I think we have to address some pandemic issues because it's obviously influenced everything we're all doing in the last four months. I don't wanna, I don't wanna linger there for the entirety of this discussion, but <clears throat> at least at the start. And, and if again, uh, uh, Heather, um, how much did you get from the CARES Act and, and how long do you think it will last you and kind of how are you using it right now? All right, so we got 7.2 million, which is uh, about three times what we normally receive. We do receive five of the six small transit intensive cities funding. So that really helped us with our CARES Act funding as well. Um, right now, we have about 50% of that drawn down and spent. Um, and so we have about 50% left to get us through this fiscal year. We've been using it to offset our operating cost to replace some of the tax revenue and fair revenue that we've lost. Yeah, and so 
So the idea then, if, you've, if you're about 50% in, you figure it may get you to the end of the calendar year? I think it will get us just past the end of the calendar year. Okay. How about you, Kevin? We got $9.7 million um, at CARES Act money. Uh, we're programming it currently, trying to get to the end game with the FTA grant. And we're gonna use that money to fund the operation in fiscal year 2021. And we're reserving one and a half million dollars to upgrade our technology, our uh, fare box, uh, dispatching and video surveillance. Uh, our technology is about 15 years old. So uh, we wanna modernize. So uh, um, we're using it to operate the whole system and supplement 50% of local operating subsidies. Bob, where, where do you guys stand? Yeah, we received $6.4 million in CARES funding. Uh, we anticipate that to last us through uh, February of 2021. And we, we've been using that for um, purchase of cleaning supplies, PPE, shields, uh, protective shields in the buses for our drivers. We've also used it for cleaning, um, preventive maintenance, salaries for our drivers, salaries for administration and, uh, and benefits. In terms of, you know, where we are right now is we're all starting to see ridership return at varying levels. Um, and I'm curious if you guys uh, have seen yet or, or are how you're anticipating when you hit that point when your ridership returns in, in enough numbers that the social distancing and the restrictions on how many people you can have on a bus if you're operating that way creates kind of the, um, uh, uh, a problem in terms of your capacity to serve at those lower levels of people on your vehicles. H have any of you been, been looking at that issue? So I, I'll jump in yeah. uh, here in Flagstaff. We, um, being part of Arizona, our essential trips order was um, probably not as strict as some other states, just based on our review. We never actually implemented mandatory social distancing nor vehicle capacity limits. We allowed our passengers to make those decisions on behalf of themselves. We did create distancing for our driver. And one of the things that we did throughout COVID was monitor our ridership. We knew what capacity looked like with appropriate distancing and we offered shadow buses um, when appropriate. We're going back to full service next week. And part of the reason for that is the students are moving back into the community and we're gonna use the frequency to create the distancing opportunity. So I think that's, an, that's, a, that's a really important point there. Do you feel like you have enough vehicles in your fleet to fully be able to implement that? Um, we, we do. Our fleet does, uh, we have a 30% backup ratio. So we're, we're comfortable that we have the fleet. Our biggest concern is if we do start to see another uh, high absenteeism rate, we may not have staffing for it. Yeah, yeah. How about you, Kevin? How, in, in terms of the, the original question, is that an issue you're looking at in Gulfport? And if so, how, how are you going to attack it? We're, we're at pre-COVID levels of service, but we're at 60% of ridership. Okay. Uh, we were doing some uh, mandating social distancing early on, but we're not now. We were just in the last two weeks uh, with our growth in our ridership and a spike. We're, we're one of the hot spots in the country and our service area is one of the hot spots in the state uh, with, with flare-ups. And we were looking at implementing uh, some, some blocking off some seats, but we decided not to do that. And we basically let our ridership uh, social distance. Uh, we, we have enough capacity on our buses. It's not a problem. So uh, it, it, we were doing it early on, but not now. And uh, we, we require people to wear face masks, which seem currently to be the most important thing. And, and so everybody that comes in our facilities or boards one of our buses is required to wear a face mask at all time. If they don't have one, we hand them out. And all of that's worked really well. Uh, but it's 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 been flux in a state of flux all along what we do we've ramped up we've ramped down and done all kind of things all kind of gyrations based on cdc advice and our governor's issue and all of these yeah. directives so, so sometimes 
uh, er early on, our management staff literally met every day, Monday through Friday, and did calls on the weekend. Now we're down to meeting one day a week. So we we we've got some kind of stability going on here. That's important. I mean, uh, 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 for the staff and also for the service, and so the community and the ridership can begin to have some reasonable expectations of what they're going to find when they when they go to ride. Bob, how's things been in Scranton? I know Pennsylvania's had probably a little bit more uh, strict orders from the governor and other things. How are you dealing with that? Well, we have. Like right now, we're, we're not back at full service, um, at pre-COVID service. We did some stages. When, when uh, things came down earlier in, in March, we re reduced our service from normal service to a Saturday schedule, but we did that Monday through Saturday. And then when the governor came out with the stay at home and more businesses started to close, et cetera, we went to even a deeper cut. So now we went from that deeper cut back to the Saturday schedule and our next phase will be full service. So we're not at full service yet. Our ridership at one point was 25% of pre-COVID and both in shared ride and fixed route. It's up to 40% in fixed route and shared ride is about 55 but we're trying to social distance uh, on our shared ride vehicles. We've been scheduling basically four passengers per vehicle and you know, it's a 16 passenger, whatever, 14 passenger vehicle. So, and in fixed route, we've, uh, you know, we alleviated the fares both in, in shared ride, ADA and fixed route for in March, we reinstated the fares back July 1st. But um, that kept people away from the driver, put the shields up and that. And we require masks now on our buses, both of our drivers and our passengers. Um, we are sending, we still have the capability uh, of having a few extra drivers around in buses. So if our fixed route buses get too crowded uh, and we were trying to distance them six feet from the driver and then separating, but then we'll send an extra bus out to alleviate the, the ridership. Uh, but I could see it coming as when we're into full, as, it, as ridership's going up and, and we're, we're getting to full uh, service, then we're going to need more buses, obviously, and we'll, we'll need more drivers. So it's going to be a little harder to do that um, socially distance as we are now in, in a couple months, if it continues to increase. Yeah, you know, I think Kevin has a really interesting perspective on this because he was running the system when Katrina hit. So he's he's been through what the worst disasters can look like. And and for those of you, I visited Kevin not too long after that. And it 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 it, it I'll never forget it, for one. And when I hear people talk about that that Hurricane Katrina was a was was a New Orleans event, I always say to them, Go, if you had seen Mississippi, you'd know Mississippi took the brunt of that storm, not New Orleans. How's your ex how does this compare? And maybe what did you learn from dealing with such a massive disaster like Katrina that you've applied to this different type of disaster that we're working with right now? Well, well, we weren't, we learned a lot. The thing, the main thing we did wrong, the two main things we did wrong uh, briefly in Katrina is we did not communicate well enough with the community what we were doing, and we did not focus enough on our employees. So we, we applied those lessons learned to this particular event, and uh, we made sure that we were communicating because of the health risk to our employees that we were communicating with them and listening and giving them a sense of comfort in what we were doing. And we were communicating to the public, uh, the service ramped up, it ramped down like others and all these gyrations are going on and it's all confusing on what we're doing, when and how. And so communicating to the public and our employees on a daily basis and being out in the field and, and taking care of our people, what I mean is, 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 is in pay. Uh, we are uh, concerned about their physical health as well as their financial health has really paid off for us. And we've been blessed to have a, a group of dedicated people that have mostly been on the job during this event and it's ongoing. We had very few people that chose to go home. You know, when they could have stayed home and got paid, we had very few employees that did that. So that was the lesson to learn. 
uh, from Katrina that that really helped us in in this particular event. How about you, Heather? What do you what, what are your takeaways now? I mean, and I hate kind of talking about COVID nineteen like it's done because it's not. But thus far, what are the takeaways? You've been on the job since February, so you've gone right through the ringer with it. What, what are your takeaways that that you would share with your successor, however long, to say, here's what I learned that you need to know? I, I think for us, I, uh, the advice I would give anyone is don't discount your employees. Um, similar to the prior statement, our, we didn't lose any staff. Uh, we were able to keep people full-time employed, but they were willing to step into any role. Um, so we used drivers who wouldn't have a driving route to clean buses and they came to work with smiles and the same dedication as they did to driving the bus. So I think for us that was the biggest lesson and, and these are people I've worked with for a long time but as the GM I was uh, humbled by how willing our staff were to come in and get the job done and their interest in making sure we served people. So our paratransit has been significantly hit with COVID. People are afraid to travel, centers are closed and things like that and they care uh, the ideas of bringing their medicine to them, bringing their meals to them, doing grocery delivery. I just extremely impressed by the ideas that come right out of our employees, um, out of their care for our community. And, and those stories just have to be shared. Yeah, Bob, you know, I think there was, there was like a lot of confusion on so many fronts when, you know, in the first two weeks of March, when we were all kind of confronting this. And one element that started to come forward was like essential only service. And, and did that teach you anything about your service in Scranton? Like for how many people your service is essential? And, and kind of how did you react to, to, to that designation if that was something that you had to look at? Well, you know, we, we were very careful when we were cutting service. I mean, we had to cut it back, obviously, but we knew about the essential workers. So we transport uh, a lot of essential workers to their jobs. And not only that, but showing how essential we are, I mean, taking our, our people to hospitals and doctor visits, and you know, hard time for people to get food at times. I mean, the only way they had to get there was for us. So we, you know, you really, it hit home seeing that, you know, people calling and talking to them that, hey, you're my only way to get some food or, you know, so, you know, we, we provided uh, a demand response service for people in the areas that we, we cut some service back with. So they could just come in and through our shared ride, we, we provided demand response service to them. But I mean, I think a takeaway for us too is our employees. I, you know, my, all my employees, my staff, uh, my maintenance mechanics, the drivers, they all stepped up. They all came right forth and did what they needed to do. And it showed the concern our drivers too have for the, for the public, for our passengers. And uh, I, I think we really learned, learned a lot there too. Yeah. Why, well, uh, Kevin, give us a kind of close out the COVID-19 part of this discussion. Where, um, what about this keeps you up at night right now? You know, we're like I said, we're not through this. We've got, we've still got a lot of issues to to tackle. You're at sixty percent of your ridership, but what is that component of this that that really concerns you? And share that with your fellow ma managers because I, I would imagine everybody's feeling some of that. I don't think you'd be human if you weren't right now. Will it ever end? <laughs> And the misinformation has been problematic uh, from the CDC, from the government. It, it, uh, you know, it's, I keep telling our, our staff, it's novel, it's new. There's, you know, it's a lot, there's not a lot of experience behind it. Constantly changing is, is very difficult. Don't know what to expect next. And, um, you know, we're, we're going through a spike right now. It is really running rampant through our community. Uh, some of my family members are starting to catch it and, it's just uh, the unknown, what, you know, what's coming next. And, uh, you know, we went through the first phase and we got through that and we thought we were in the clear. And now the, the second phase is worse than the first because we're, we opened our community and everybody went back to work and started gathering. So that and, uh, you know, f the, the CARES Act, Act money has been a blessing to take care of the financial aspect of it. But it's just the unknown is what, you know, where are we really going with all this? What is, what is the service going to look like six months from now? Yeah, it, 
more than any other time in, in my 30 years in the business, this just calls, this is called into question everything. I mean, literally every piece of it. Now, now Bob, Kevin would be a self-described prepper. And I would imagine that Kevin would tell us that and he's here because he went through something like Katrina. So he, he, he collects and is, and is constantly prepared. How did you feel like you were where you were at the onset in terms of preparation for, for something as, as ground changing as this has been? Well, I, I think, um, you know, we started a little bit, maybe too late getting supplies. Uh, and, uh, but we, we did and, and we weren't totally prepared because we haven't gotten through this, but I, I, I think everything we put into place, obviously we immediately reacted. We got supplies as quickly as we could. And, and we started to do the um, cleaning of, of the buses and the vans. We, we, every night we fogged each bus and van every, every night and set up some uh, cleaners and maintenance workers down at uh, our transit center. So they would hop on and hit the high, tr high touch areas quickly as a bus pulled in. And, and the same thing at our, at our um, location here, our administrative offices, you know, the cleaning and that. So we, we weren't as prepared as, because we've never gone through it before as, as most others, but I mean, I, everybody reacted quickly. And I think what we've done uh, worked out very well. Uh, I think, you know, maybe uh, would I do something differently down the road? I think I would have a plan uh, more for every department, a, a finance plan for some extra funding on the side, a, a maintenance plan uh, to uh, stockpile some of our supplies, things like that. But I mean, even with maintenance, we, we reacted quickly. And when, when we had more buses around uh, because they're not in the road, we just kept rotating and bringing buses in to repair either it was a mechanical or body uh, repairs to these buses now while we had them extra. So we caught up on a lot of stuff too. Yeah, yeah, it's been, it, it struck me. So, so CTA's DC office was last opened officially on the 13th of March. And I was going home from work that day and I, I went down into the Metro subway system and there was a gentleman at the bottom of the escalator and he was an employee and he had this massive box of look like like Clorox wipes or something. And he was just holding the wipe on the runner of the escalator until it went dry. And he was tossing it and taking another one out. And, and he was just there doing that. And it just, I was like, oh, wow, this is the, like, they can't do that forever. You know, right. it was just like, it, it really struck me. So, so Heather, what from this, is is what you're going to carry forward like what what has some what has been something that you've changed that you've set in place that is is going to be locked in at NAPTA moving forward so like others we weren't prepared for the cleaning so again we are focused on how do we change our inventory controls but the actual methods of cleaning, the frequency of cleaning, we intend to keep all of those in place because we think long-term they're just the right measures to have in place for the health of our employees as well as our passengers. Um, we did send a lot of people to work from home and we're in the middle of building a new downtown connection center where we planned all of this office space. We're starting to rethink that. Do we need that office space? Could we use that space differently? Um, because I have employees that never wanna come back to the office. They're very happy working in their home and they're very effective and they're very efficient there. So um, those are things that we're looking at is what flexibility do we have to identify and now how do we implement it and keep it so that employees have more work-life balance and we're struggling with how do we offer that same thing to our operators but looking for ways to give different schedules, different shifts so that they have that balance um, that someone who gets the opportunity to work from home has. Well, um, thanks. Uh, I think what we wanna do now is is before we move on invite the the participants here all of you do you have comments questions have you something that as we've been discussing these things you really wanted to say um i would ask you if you do have something like that
just put your name in the chat room. I'll call on you and you can unmute and, and fire away and then, and then re-mute rather than having any of us talk over each other. But I wanted to give this, you know, give, give everyone a chance. Thanks, LJ, you're up. Yeah, one of the things, we're a, a small um, fixed route system. We have 10 buses and five paratransit vehicles. Um, I think one of the, the things that I wonder about for the long term is a, specifically a big bus side. Um, our, our drivers are really hemmed in that corner. And I wonder, I mean, buses have been that way for decades, but they don't have a driver's door to exit the way our van and LTV drivers do. And I've already asked Gillig this, um, but I'm, I'm curious if the vehicle manufacturers will be able to, uh, will choose to create a, a protected vacuum airspace for the operators to healthily work in. Um, I know we're probably all aware, hopefully we haven't all experienced it. Also the security issue with um, drivers that have been um, assaulted for trying to enforce mask policies where it's widely publicly known, but we live in an angry world now. And those two things we're, we're, a little delayed getting our vehicle barriers because we're doing floor to ceiling barriers for our vans and LTVs in addition to having them custom made for our buses as well. So I hope the vehicle manufacturers on the, for those of us who do some level of fixed route service um, for both our members and APTA members that there might be a way in the future for drivers to be able to exit the vehicle and be in a, in a separate um, airspace so that they, you know, this, this is, we could get through COVID and then there could be COVID 2.0 or 3.0 in two years or six years, and then we're doing another version of this all over again. It's not like this is, we hope this is once in a lifetime, but hope is not a plan. So no, sorry, that's just my thought on that's that. A, that's a really good point. And, and a couple of issues raised there that I think um, we all need to be discussing. Uh, I've, got, I've had some of the similar discussions carrying forward to the, to the bus manufacturers. Airflow is critical, right? I mean, Absolutely. most of what we're learning about this virus is telling us that airflow and, and kind of airborne transmission is the most dangerous. And we spent a lot of time, rightfully so, on high touch areas. And I think that's gonna have to continue as Heather was talking about, but, but man, airflow through the vehicle um, and, and is, is, is something that I know the manufacturers are, are aggressively looking at. I've got a call next week with Proterra on the same topic. Um, and you know, I was one who, who argued with the Hill and other people, hey, um, we don't want barriers between drivers and passengers. That, that uh, uh, unless it's warranted, don't mandate. I, I, I tend not to like ever when the federal government and FTA mandate things based on just a minimum number of systems experience. But in this case, the barriers have been absolute. I mean, just from the, air, from the airborne piece, I'm curious though, how, how do we enforce mask wearing without making the operators, the enforcement agent of that and thus putting them again at a higher risk in an angry world, as you, as I would agree, of having to deal with some of that. Has anybody come up with a good answer to that? Well, what we do here, and, and we're always conscious of our drivers, we want to, don't want to create any more conflict with the, the riders than already exist. So uh, we require people to wear masks, but if they get on board and they refuse, we just send a supervisor out and, and let them deal with it and try and talk sense into the person. Uh, and then if they still refuse, we just call the police and let them deal with it. So we, we absolutely do not want our drivers engaging in a verbal confrontation over a face mask. It's, it's just not that big a deal. So that's how we handle it and our drivers really ap appreciate that. So we don't want them to be the face mask police. Anybody else? Yeah. We, we, uh... I believe the same thing Kevin's saying. We don't want our drivers getting in any altercations. Uh, however, our governor mandated masks on public transit, made it a little easier for us. And so, yeah. you know, the signage everywhere is mask mandated. We haven't, knock on wood, had any issues. If someone comes without a mask, we do have masks available for them at the transit center on the bus. So they, 
we can say we have a mask for you. And unless it's a medical condition, obviously we're hoping they wear them. But uh, once again, if, um, if they don't, we, we're not getting into an altercation with them. We, yeah, no, I think, and, and I, I meet every other week with FTA leadership and APTA leadership and AASHTO leadership. And that was for several months, you know, when FTA finally got all those masks and started <clears throat> in massive quantities getting those out, boy, that was great to see. I, I think the ability to say, oh, you don't have one here is so much better right. and, and has helped. So Corey had a question and wanted to raise some issues about uh, uh, CARES Act and hazard pay. Go ahead, Corey. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so here in Missoula, uh, after we received our CARES funding in, when was that, April? I can't remember now. Uh, when we finally did uh, submit our grant to what we're going to use it for, uh, there was a press release uh, put out by FTA, and the press release was captured as new money, like we got more money again, uh, which unfortunately, you know, kind of works against us. Yes. Uh, but now we have, we have some operators that are talking about, well, you know, how about hazard pay? You know, there was no talk of it before, but now that the CARES funding has been brought up again, like we have all this money, why not give us some hazard pay? I want to know what uh, everybody else is doing and has there been any ask for hazard pay on by your operators? That's a good question. I've, I've heard that called honor pay uh, uh, at some systems as well. Has, uh, we've, I've talked to a number of CTA members, Corey, that have instituted that. Um, because they wanted to incentivize, you know, obviously the, the operators who've been doing this from the beginning. Bob, Kevin, Heather, have you? Yeah, yeah. Corey, I, I agree with you. We had the same, as soon as our union saw that there was $6.4 million coming, one of the first thing we, we heard is, hey, what, you know, how about hazard pay? You've got all this money. Uh, not realizing what this money was going for and, and the future of other funds may be cut. So, um, you know, there's what else, the other thing that's making it tough with us is there are here in our state, there are a couple transit agencies that are giving some sort of a bonus or hazard pay and our unions find out because some of those are the same union. So they're coming back, hey, you know, this agency is doing it are you going to do it? Um, here in Pennsylvania, there's a grant out there that you could apply for if, if any of your uh, employees are making less than $20 an hour. And, and it's, a, it's a grant that grants uh, up to $1,200 an employee hazard pay. It's paid over a 10-week period. It's $3 added to their hourly wage for 10 weeks. So there are systems applying for that and we, we are applying for it because some only only our one union here our shared ride drivers make less than 20 at the fixed route don't they can't qualify but my board is instructing me now to to look into some sort of a bonus for them and obviously not calling it hazard pay but so we're researching a little bit and we're looking to see what we could do um to help them out but yes the, i i know a lot of agencies that are being asked by their employees or unions well you know uh, yeah oh go ahead heather i was just gonna say we introduced a two dollar an hour wage adjustment we were very careful not to call it hazard pay we just didn't label it um and we are still giving that two dollar an hour wage adjustment so it's been available since march 21st to our staff members for anyone working in a public facing position so that includes our bus washers and our detailers and our mechanics when they're out in the field because we felt like it was more than the operators that were potentially exposed. So we are yeah. um, starting to phase that out. So it's $2 an hour right now. September 1st, it goes to a dollar an hour. And right now we plan on October 1st to stop with that wage adjustment. So, and that's where we're at with ours. And we actually use cost savings to do it. That's how we proposed it from the beginning. We went from 20 minute frequency on some of our routes to an hour. And that amount of savings allowed us to then offer this wage adjustment. So we were able to do it before the CARES Act even. I can tell you that um, I've talked directly to FTA at the federal level. They, they approve 
of using the CARES Act funds, so that's not an issue uh, on that sense. Um, I'm going to pick on Jeff Hazen, who is in Oregon, uh, who in the chat box has I, raised an issue that I think is important within the discussion of COVID-19, and that was Oregon being kind of uh, out there early on allowing for a three-foot rather than a six-foot social distancing, and that coming from the governor. I see Alan at Salem, uh, Salem, Oregon system. Can you, how did that transpire in Oregon? Because I think there's a lot of states that would like to see a governor saying things like that for where transit's headed. I can unmute you, Jeff, if that's okay. He said he didn't have audio, Scott. Ah, Alan, do you have audio? Can you hear me? Can, yeah. Okay, so thanks and hello everybody. Glad to be a part of this. Uh, uh, good job, Scott and team, getting this uh, virtual conference going. Um, so you want to know about the governor's... Uh, yeah, I want to uh, know how you yeah. guys were able to talk enough transit to the governor that there was a realization that long-term six-foot social distancing isn't going to work, particularly as ridership returns. Three feet makes a big difference yeah. uh, on a 35-, on a, on a 40-foot bus on how many people you can put on. How did that transpire? Yeah, so as the governor was dealing through a lot of these issues, she convened, I guess, what I'll call, or, okay, let me get off the, in the video too. I guess she convened what I would call a subject matter expert, expert work groups. Um, uh, uh, our, our deputy general manager, chief operations officer, uh, represented us on that. Uh, uh, and she seeked input. Uh, uh, her staff uh, liaison uh, reached out uh, to the group with so, some draft plans, asked us to comment on them. Uh, all the group, uh, from what I was briefed on, the group worked on them, uh, provided their input and rationale, and I, and I believe for the most part, they took mo most everything that was uh, requested. The, the subject matter expert group was made up of uh, representatives of, uh, in Oregon, the, the big three, TriMet, Lane, and Salem. Uh, and a large grouping of the smaller uh, urban and even the, the county type little systems to get input because we one of the things we preached is one size does not fit all uh, based on, on size. So uh, so it was a collaborative process. Uh, uh, so it wasn't done to us. It was done with us. I, yeah, I, I think those kinds of discussions are going to be so critical as we move through this current phase and look, let's all hope we get to the end of this at some point in time and, and how we manage. Because uh, I've talked to a bunch of operators uh, who are, I kind of, I would say they're in the same camp that Heather is in, in Flagstaff, which is like, well, we've been told just to put people on the buses and not necessarily adhere to that. And I, there's, there's, it's just better to have some sort of structure to that than um, the uh, the way that many of us operate, which is uh, better to ask uh, forgiveness than permission kind of thing, because this is a serious issue. Um, uh, and, and I see uh, Jackie Montgomery, who's a board member at CTA, in the chat box mentioned about contract amendments for hazard pay. I'm going to ask Jackie if she can get us any samples of that. And if we have some, something like that, I'll send that around to the group so that you can all kind of see some of the language that other folks are using to do this. Uh, anyway. Scott, this oh, is good. Jackie. Jackie. I'd be happy to send that. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think it's always great to have something to kind of start from when, you, when you're doing that rather than, than uh, particularly something that clearly if you provide it, it's already stood up to legal and some of the other uh, ramifications of that. Yeah, and we also, <clears throat> we did do a webinar on it with Jim LaRouche and a couple of their operators, and I'll send you the link. It's recorded, so anybody can listen to it that would like to. Oh, excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Is there anything else anybody wanted to raise before we move on to 
uh, the world of providing transit in small urban areas and not just on COVID-19. All right, well, uh, one of the things that we wanted to talk about because um, as we said, and I think Bob highlighted it well, world go, the world goes on. And, and many of you probably somewhere in your pipeline have capital projects and improvements. I know Heather talked about one, Kevin talked about one. Give us a sense, Kevin, on your major project uh, in, in Gulfport with the, with the new aquarium, how has been working on that amidst all this? And, and what has that done to your timetables and schedules? And do you have any um, recommendations for others here that are in the middle of major projects like that, kind of what they ought to be looking at? Well, when all this started, the city of Gulfport was in the process of building a $65 million aquarium, a major regional family attraction. And we had three major capital projects going on to support it. A renovation of our existing garage. We were renovating a historical building to be our new transit hub, a $10 million project. And then a $10 million PID transit bridge we were building. So all of this has been very interesting. Uh, already had my plate full and then this COVID thing uh, hit. I've, I've, I've come to be proficient at crisis management by necessity over the years, all the things we've been through, but uh, that, that, that's okay. What, what they, you know, they say what does not kill us makes us stronger. So uh, this COVID thing has really disturbed the contracts um, not so much with labor here in Mississippi uh, as it has availability of construction materials. So it has caused a several month delays in most of our contracts and increased the price of, accordingly. Anytime there's, you know, a force majeure event in the contract outside of their control certainly uh, has, you know, has a, a economic impact on that. So we, we just kind of keep throwing money at it. So. Uh, th things are starting to get back on track now just because of a sense of comfort with people of, of, of you know, a little bit of stability in the construction environment. So uh, that's what we had going on when all this hit. How about you, Heather? You, you alluded to this, this major uh, project. And one of the things I'm, I'm, I'm wondering is, did as you kind of slowed your service a little bit, did that give you any more time to focus on the project? Unfortunately, it didn't because the project is, is stuck with other agencies um, that we're partnering with. So unfortunately, it didn't there. But some of the slowdown that we did re have or experience allowed us to really do our uh, annual bus shelter rehabilitation program without impacting riders at the same rate we would in other years. So we were able to advance capital projects and we've not, we don't have any plans to delay any of the projects that we currently have war awarded. So um, things are still moving ahead and we hope that DCC shakes out of our partners' hands soon. Yeah, yeah. I, I, and one, I think that's the reality. What Kevin and Heather are discussing has been the reality of trying to do capital projects. There's been this, I've, I've been in meetings and virtual meetings with, with members of Congress and transit kind of policy people. And then there, there's been this theory that, oh, well, they've all reduced service so much that now they can just get these capital projects done because they have so much time. And I've always found myself saying, that sounds great in theory, but the practice of all this is a completely different animal. And I think you're, you're, you're both nodding like, yeah, that's, that's the reality. How about you, Bob? Have you, do you have any projects like that in the works? Well, we do. We have a major capital project. Our, our building here, our administrative building, and we also uh, have our maintenance facility here in our storage. Um, we're going to be undergoing a uh, redesign. So that was started as far as the design had started before COVID. Um, we are delayed. And one of the reasons we're delayed is because we're taking over some land next to us. And so it was a slower process, but part of it was a little bit was because of COVID because, you know, going through the court system, we're shut down a little bit and, you know, it, we're going through uh, eminent domain there. Um, so uh, we are uh, going back on track now. Um, the, the money was, fortunately, it was already programmed before uh, COVID by PennDOT 
department's transportation. So we're, we're not worried about the funding part being cut back. But um, what they're gonna do is, is a redesign of our facility, add it, adding uh, to the maintenance garage, adding to the storage facility. Uh, we're building a compressed natural gas fueling station here for our buses. And we're one of seven transit agencies in the state that actually will have a fueling station for the public too of compressed natural gas. So uh, it, it's gonna be a nice project. And it's, yeah. I spoke with our people in Harris in PennDOT today, yesterday. And uh, so we're gonna be starting to move back on it now. Good, good. Well, that, that's good to hear. One of the things that um, I heard early on uh, in, in, and we were, we were discussing service redesigns last year and the previous year when we were in Flagstaff for the Sun Conference two years ago. You know, the design of services to match up with ridership trends and patterns to, to sort of kind of meet the expectations that TNCs in our communities have brought forward, you know, the, the instant gratification society that we're all, I, I don't want to wait for a bus kind of thing. I'm curious, you know, the, many of us were already considering these service redesigns prior to March 1. Um, but for the three of you, what's been your mindset about the way you put your service on the streets? And are there service redesigns that you may have had in the back of your mind that may have moved a little bit more forefront in, 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 in the uh, ensuing months here? Uh, I could answer that first, if you don't mind. I, so yeah, exactly what you said, Scott, we did have service redesign in the back of our mind, uh, but we did take, COVID pushed us and we took advantage of, of COVID to, uh, to right size the system. We've been working on it for the last few months. Um, September 8th, we're going we're gonna to introduce two new routes, one in the commerce area, one in the industrial area. Um, in uh, October, we're going to, we're actually, there's 11 more routes that we're changing up. Um, we're probably going to, we're going to update them to make them a little bit better as far as the runs and that move, move some service to where we, we, we see the need and then cut back. Actually, we're going to eliminate two routes also. So those routes that are going to be eliminated, we're going to service through a demand response and, and, and actually introduce some microtransit in that area too. So we have taken this time to right size and get us where we need to be, but we're not going to unveil that full new service until October. Yeah. How about you, Heather or Kevin? Anything like that on on on, on in your agenda? So one of the things that happened for us in Flagstaff during this was we identified a uh, underserved area that is some of our most vulnerable population, and that became much more apparent um, during COVID. So we're actually going back and redoing our five-year plan because our five-year plan did not include serving this area as a priority, and we think we need to revisit that. So not really a system redesign um, or anything that you're really talking about, but that's what, what we are trying to use COVID as an opportunity to do is really look at, our, do we have service where it needs to be? That's really interesting though, to, to say that the onset of a pandemic really made stark for you where the most vulnerable populations were, and then to say, okay, how do I try to make sure our service can match up with that? That's a that's a that's a very interesting take on that, Kevin. You have anything like that in the, in the in the works? Yes, we were looking at that already. Uh, resetting our business model, what services the community wants and will use, and how do we deliver that? And we were looking at the universe of what everybody else was doing and considering what could be applied to our community. I like mobility as a service concept. Uh, we're going to look at that real strong. Uh, of course, uh, I'm glad we didn't go through that process and get ready to implement something because COVID certainly will, will change how we look at all of that as far as safety and, uh, you know, uh, the, the stigma with public transit for health now with COVID. So, uh, yeah, it is early next year, we're going to be starting to look real strong about what our service is going to look like going into the next 10 years. So we're looking forward to that. We, for those of you interested in this topic, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask Lou from Bloomington, who's going to be speaking, 
at the next session on uh, technology-based service redesign. But would you mind, Lou, giving us kind of a, um, a Reader's Digest version of, uh, or maybe a preview so you can attract more people to your breakout uh, uh, later? Thanks, Scott. Uh, are you talking about microtransit? Yep, absolutely, exactly. Okay, thank, thank you. Um, well, here in Bloomington, uh, we've been kicking around the idea of uh, implementing a microtransit service program, and it was going to be part of our service changes. We did a, a major study in the past year where we evaluated all of our routes, and we're doing a, a overhaul of our entire fixed route system. And one of the ideas or concepts that we looked at as part of the study was to replace some of our late night fixed route service with micro transit service. And, and the idea being that it potentially uh, would be a cost savings measure, an efficiency measure, and, and an innovation measure. And we're a college town here, uh, big on innovation, big on uh, technology application. So we wanted to dip our toe in the water. We did apply for an IMI grant uh, last year. We were not successful in getting that grant. Um, then the, uh, the pandemic hit in the springtime. Um, you know, you would think that, uh, you know, we might lose interest. Uh, you know, that we were uh, dealing with all the brush fires that the pandemic brought. We reduced service. Uh, university students went home here. And, uh, but it occurred to us that microtransit might have a different application and it's one that we're interested in here, and, and that is what happens if your workforce gets sick with COVID to a large extent, how do you provide a, you know, a worst case scenario type of service in the community here? And, and if, you know, if all of our drivers or a good portion of our drivers or our entire maintenance staff went down with COVID, we didn't wanna leave the community in the lurch without a service. So we began exploring a, sort of a microtransit alternative and, and we opened discussions with Uber and Lyft, which are already well mobilized in our community here. Yep. And we're in the process now of putting together, a, again, a worst case scenario mechanism where we can use Uber and Lyft and subsidize that service through a voucher program with them uh, so that the community will have transportation in the event that you know, a good number of our employees come down with COVID and we're not able to provide service. I, I will say that we made it all the way to August 1st before our first driver came I down saw with that COVID. that the news just the other day, yeah. Yeah, and so we, we had our first driver. We had a maintenance employee in, in mid-July that came down with it. So we've, we've had two employees that have come down with it and crossing our fingers that, uh, you know, it's not going to have a major impact on us. But But those are some of the things that, we're interested in microtransit for. And I think the major message we're all sharing here and hearing is that um, the concepts of redesign and, and service design, um, that, that, that work needs to continue, but now also be informed by the new reality that we're dealing with. Uh, that, that, that the thinking among small urban agencies of how else can I serve, whether it's mobility as a service or working with TNCs or contracting with, with VIA for something like their kinds of service. There's, there's, a, there's many ways to kind of assemble your service today, but the idea is that, that now you have to hastily put over an, like an umbrella the reality of what we've been dealing with the last four months but I also want to say that I don't believe that, that there are parts of what we've seen the last four months that are going to be permanent and there are parts that are not. And that's going to be the critical piece in the decision making for all of you as managers and transit leaders is to make those decisions wisely. You don't want to expend a lot of time and resources on something that's temporary that may only be in play until a vaccine arrives, which could be in the next three to four months, knock on wood. But you also wanna use what you've learned, how your community's changed, how the expectations have changed 
to kind of already have that service ready for that new normal, which will arrive in 2021. So has anybody else in the group here, and again, I'd say just give me your name in the chat box and I'll call on you. Do you, has anybody else been working on something like this that they'd like to share? Because I think this is a critical piece of, of managing these types of systems right now is, is where you place your bets on this, this combination of technology, service, community, these pieces. So do we, do we have any brave takers who'd like to interject here? Mr. Bruffy, go for it. Yeah, so it was, you know, we had some of the same challenges. We had an early COVID, um, a driver that was diagnosed early. And this was before we'd really um, convinced everyone that this was as serious as it was. So we had um, exposure of seven other drivers. Fortunately, with the time frame and the tracing, the 48 hours, we were able to make it through that eight driver down. I was already short about 20% on drivers. We were able to make it through without missing service. So one of the considerations that we're putting in place in anticipation of WVU coming back is uh, I've rescheduled all of our routes and our runs so that we're probably gonna go to a, a coded system. If we're at level A service, everything's normal. If we're at level B, this route and this route's gonna drop out first. We have to have something in place so that our supervisors, when they show up that morning, they can react immediately. So I've got eight different routes that they can drop out in order. And you're looking at social justice issues. You're looking at trying not to create a transit desert. Yeah. Um, but that's been a real challenge. And, and we use the Remix platform to help us do that. If we hadn't already had that, I can't imagine how you would do that with 25 routes. So that was a, a different um, tack on on you know driver shortage if you will and one of the things that you had toyed with was some sort of look at uh, uh, reservation based operations yeah I, I read an article um, what they were doing in Italy and in I think Japan a couple of other c countries internationally they we were talking with um, one of our vendors with Ecolane about creating a transit quarter and that transit quarter, let's say it's the red line, the service appointments would still be on that quarter, but we would no longer run um, a schedule. We would only run by appointment. So that way, if you uh, called to make an appointment or you tried to make an appointment on the app and there was no capacity, you would know you had to go to a different run or a different time and it would push you to a different time. If we couldn't give you a ride, then it would tell you, no, you're, you're going to have to find an alternative means to get there. The problem we ran into was the amount of time that we had between trying to come up with this idea and figuring out how we're going to get it implemented in the middle of a pandemic while we're still running service before the university. So it became overwhelming and we're like, yeah, we're just going to have to wait to see what happens a little bit, I think. But I, the, I applaud the thinking because you know, we, we, we use these phrases like mobility as a service and, and kind of ridership based, you know, but when you're thinking like that, you're really drilling down to that passenger and, and, and being, trying to come up with ways to make the essential trip happen. Yeah. And, and even if it gets uh, waylaid or uh, uh, you learn something from it and, and, that that that's I think a an important piece. Anybody else before we move on on kind of service redesigns that they want to share? Scott, just the some IT that we're doing here. Yeah. Um, uh, we're we're looking at the uh, cashless fare system. So the tap card, you could reload the card, just tap it, go through there. That's that's our next project here at Colts. Yeah, I think the the, the cashless piece is going to, this is going to be the onset that within the next decade, even the smallest rural systems are going to be cashless or, or offer that. I really think that um, that's going to be uh, 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 a, a long-term impact of what, we, right. what we've seen here. Uh, uh, LJ, you have something to add on that? 
I second it back to undoing. Um, so we had we have actually gone ahead and completed our installation of a touchless um, system, but um, sort of taking both the COVID scenario um, and what that's given us and um, the post George Floyd incident, we've actually made a motion to our elected officials to permanently remove fares, um, both to provide additional access about 90% of our ridership here um, are uh, on the significantly lower end of the financial spectrum. Um, and when we've had small fare free things in the past, we've had huge bursts in ridership, but it also would allow us to keep the rear door entry during COVID, um, which is a challenge. We can't really functionally collect fares or do fare enforcement of any sort um, with the fare box up front, but we're keeping people away from the driver. So um, that is to be determined sometime in September, October, but that's what we're actually pending on, which would be kind of weird since we've already paid for and installed the system and then this all hit. Um, but if we do go back, at least we're prepared to have a touchless um, and or app based system um, and, and a way for um, those who, who are unbanked to be able to pay moving forward. So we're kind of set whether we keep fares or we don't. It's a, uh, uh, Corey raised the same issue in the chat box, you know, uh, and, and, and he used it uh, properly. We don't ever want to use the word free, like fair free, uh, uh, just so everybody knows. If you're contemplating that, the discussion needs to be around being fareless, a zero fair. Um, but um, this time has raised a lot of that. And, you know, I would think, and Corey, you'd be one to, to address this, um, if you're in a, ma in, a, in a university, okay, or in a setting that ca has high frequency capacity uh, corridors, could be other trip generating corridors where you could legitimately run periods of your day at like 10 minute headways, 15 minute headways, and have very packed buses. The ability for you to do that, there's a couple things that are just kind of sitting out there that you should keep in mind. One is, so the House reauthorization bill that we'll talk a lot about tomorrow, past the House, has a lot of additional funding built into it for high capacity, high frequency service. And, and, and the House members were saying, for you small urbans, who can do that, we wanna get more money to you to help you do that. So there's one. Two, Heather brought it up earlier, the Small Transit Intensive Cities Program. So the House bill will move the takedown of 5307 up to 3% of the pot for those factors. And those factors are gonna go up significantly as that goes up. So you're gonna now be getting for every ridership factor that you hit, you're gonna be getting 250, 250K. So you hit six of them, do the math. It's a major, it's a major bump into your 5307 formula funds. If going fair free, oops, I just did it, fair list and and can allow you to leverage those stick funds and can allow you to leverage what may be in this high capacity, uh, uh, high frequency services. There's some math to be done there to explore whether or not it makes sense. It may not, but I do think that it's something that some of you should, if you haven't thought of it in that kind of context, you should be looking at. So Corey, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, let me add real quick. So we, we uh, moved to zero fare in 2015, um, and it's been, uh, at the time, it was really, there was enough support for it, but it was still, there was still not a total buy-in. We actually just did a voter phone survey last week uh, to update the one we did a year ago, because uh, the board's looking at going out for a ballot measure. And surprisingly, the, the, the two things that, that uh, pulled the highest were over 80%, 85%, uh, I believe, support for zero fare now. It's highly successful. It's been embraced by the community. Um, you know, it, it, 
with when COVID hit, that's one thing that we did not have to uh, worry about uh, the loss of fares because we had already had budgeted that in. We knew where that was from. The other was electric buses. Those are really popular too. Yeah. But uh, for our community, we have University of Montana here. Uh, Zero Fair has been highly success successful for us. So. Well, we've got a, uh, along all these lines, our next batch of sessions is gonna, you, you're all gonna have to choose if you have the time between electric buses, relationships with key partners like universities and uh, technology-based service redesign. We're recording them all. So uh, if you can't, you, you can't break yourself into three, we'll make sure you can, you can watch. But it seems like a lot of what we're talking about is a natural segue to that. So we're gonna finish up this session. And I wanted to ask Bob, Kevin, and Heather, who have been so gracious to be presenters here, for, for allow them the final word. And for each of them, what I was hoping they would say is, is in, you know, in a single sentence, where do you see a year from now when we're in Missoula, what do you think will be the biggest issue that you're facing at your transit agencies? And I didn't give them that question ahead of time. I gave them another one. So I really just threw them a curveball. But uh, uh, I have great faith that they can think on their feet. Bob, you ready? Sure. I, I think, you know, it might not be a single sentence here, but uh, uh, yeah. ridership, where is it going to be um, trying to trying to have the new norm so we can serve the people we need to and, and build the ridership up? Trying, Winning you know, that ridership, that's going to be no doubt a massive undertaking that we're all going to be working on. So that's a great one, Bob. And, and the, the other thing is, uh, I know for us, is uh, the uncertainty of funding and will our state be able to maintain the level of funding that we're getting now? Um, obviously, there's some challenges, be especially here, because you know we, we get our, um, we receive our operating money from the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation under Act 89, which is, is funded, the source is funded through sales tax, leases, fees, which we all know are all down right now. Yes. And the turnpike also in Pennsylvania that we receive some funding for our, is a $14 billion deficit right now in the state, a $6 billion deficit. Oh, so sorry. even though there's some hold harmless language in the funding, it, you know, if you don't have the money, you don't have the money. Yeah. So it's- well, Bob had two. Winning back ridership and obviously local and state funds. Real quickly, Kevin, where, where are you? Our biggest concern is funding also. Uh, state and local funding, they've been beat up pretty bad with loss of sales tax revenue and this thing is lingering on. It was, it was tough in good times. We don't have a dedicated source of revenue. I'm a professional beggar and uh, it's, I'm, I'm just more concerned now than ever of what it's gonna look like a year from now when we use up the uh, CARES Act for operating. Thanks, Kevin. Heather? So ours is more tied to both. Um, if we can't return our ridership, I don't know how I convince the public that transit is a necessary service in our community, which is an ongoing battle, and we need to go back to the tax question. So I think we need all, all those are our concerns. We need that ridership so the public sees it as necessary so they'll fund it for them. Great. Well, uh, you've seen in the chat box, we've got our uh, coffee break with GMV Synchromatics. Uh, there, the link is here to get to that. I'll ask Tony to throw that up there again. Thank you, everyone. I think it's been a really great discussion, and I appreciate it. I learn a lot in these, and uh, particularly thanks to Bob, Kevin, and Heather for agreeing to uh, be leaders here, and I look forward to seeing you all in sessions in the future here. Thanks for your Thank time. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Great job, everybody.